Okay, so here's the back story. About a year ago, Massimo Piatelli and I, um, I should say the reason for the combination, Massimo knows something about biology and I don't. Um, so uh, Massimo and Piatelli and I uh, uh, teamed up uh, to give an argument for, uh, for a claim that we both thought was probably right, though for some different reasons, somewhat different reasons. Uh, the claim is that, uh, that the uh, theory of natural selection here, in, here and after TNS uh, is inherently flawed. And, thought, and that on uh, very weak empirical assumptions, in fact, empirical assumptions that are known to be true, uh, it can't be fixed. Uh, um, I should say at the start that this is not, this is an attack on TNS, which is a rather limited, uh, highly articulate, uh, uh, compact uh, theory. It's not an attack on evolution. Evolution has all sorts of uh, significant uh, uh, claims like, for example, that speciation represents a tree or something of that kind, is represented by a tree. Uh, all sorts of claims that have nothing to do with TNS, except at one crucial point. That is that TNS it purports in the Darwinian and neo-Darwinian uh, uh, traditions uh, to give the mechanism uh, by which evolution works. Okay, so evolution uh, uh, does various kinds of things, including what will be important for us, the fixation of phenotypic traits. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and one might well ask, well, how does it go about doing that? Uh, answer, uh, well, uh, uh, it's, it, it goes about doing that because the mechanism of, uh, of the theory of natural selection, the mechanism imported uh, in the theory of natural selection is up and uh, running. So it's perfectly possible to have one's doubts about the theory of natural selection. It's even possible to have the theory, the, the, uh, the, suspi uh, the suspicion that the theory simply doesn't work um, uh, and not have any problem with evolution or, or with uh, uh, we all used to be paramecia or something of that kind. I'm taking that whole story as, as uh, uh, common ground among uh, civilized people. Uh, and, uh, and I'm not going to argue about, uh, I have no interest in creationism, I have no interest in God, I have no interest in any of that stuff. I'm interested in a f straightforwardly, I take it, uh, scientific question, namely, does the uh, theory of natural selection account for the facts about uh, phenotypic trait uh, fixation? Okay, I'm going to, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, make a couple of assumptions which, which I think uh, aren't, uh, tendentious before I get to the part that's violently tendentious. Um, the, the two assumptions I care about, and, and again, here, raise your hand if you think there's something wrong with them. Uh, the first is that the question TNS wants to answer is, just the, is the one that I just mentioned. Why do uh, creatures have the phenotypic traits that they do? That's the sort of ur question. You find a phenotypic trait, um, um, you find one of these funny animals that biologists talk about, and, and you say, gee, this is a funny animal. How come it has 400 eyes? Uh, and the answer is, well, some story that fits the general pattern of TNS uh, will show you that, uh, that uh, having uh, 400 eyes rather than 412 or, or two or something of that sort uh, is a good thing in the ecology uh, in which this uh, uh, animal lives out its uh, life. Uh, so the question is, how come is it that creatures have the phenotypic properties that they do, traits that they do? And the answer is roughly phenotypic traits are, the, are selected for, uh, at, sorry, let me reparse that. Phenotypic traits are selected for being causes of fitness, okay? So if you find me a phenotypic tri a trait on a certain kind of organism in a certain kind of ecology, uh, and you ask me how come it's that, we got that trait in this kind of organism, in this ecology, rather than some other tri uh, uh, trait. The answer is gonna be that, uh, that um, the former but not the latter, or the former but not as much as the latter, is a uh, cause of, uh, of uh, uh, fitness in that kind of organism, in this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, ecology. Um, I take it that's untendentious unless somebody thinks I've just misunderstood uh, the Darwinian tradition, which is perfectly possible. Uh, but I take it that's essentially untendentious. And, uh, and, um, um, and I take it also to be untendentious uh, that uh, if there is such a process, there must be a mechanism that performs it. So it's a test on the theory of 
natural selection or really any other scientific theory, that, uh, that uh, there must be some way, at least in principle and preferably in practice, of constructing a, a mechanism, a piece of matter, uh, such that uh, uh, given the way that mechanism is constructed and the environment in which it operates, it will in fact produce the distributions that the uh, theory uh, talks about. So non-mechanical uh, uh, examples, non-mechanical uh, answers to the to the basic question, how come organisms have the phenotypic traits they do? Non-mechanical answers are not allowed. Uh, so one thing that's not allowed is you're not allowed to say it's a miracle. And another, another thing that's not allowed is you're not allowed to say it's a creature of, uh, it's a, a consequence of, uh, uh, of divine intentions. But another one is you're not allowed to say, well, it's got to be done, done somehow, but I have no story. Uh, in fact, I can't even conceive of a story about how it's done. So we want these to be mechanical theories in some appropriate sense of, uh, uh, of mechanical. No ghosts, no miracles, none of that stuff. Okay, so um, we have this argument, uh, Massimo and I do, uh, which is that, as I think I said, on, on very, very weak empirical assumptions, uh, that, in fact, assumptions that are patently true, um, there can't be a mechanism that performs the processes that acts, that uh, runs through the processes that uh, Darwin thinks that the theory, that, or that the theory of natural uh, se selection thinks that uh, evolution uh, depends on. So there's got to be something wrong with the theory. Okay, that's going to be the form of the argument. Uh, as you can see, at least as far as I can, at least as far as I can see, there's nothing tendentious in anything that I've just said. Everybody thinks that Darwin is committed to some sort of uh, selectionist account of trade fixation. Everybody thinks that he's committed to mechanism, uh, and so on. So this is all, so this is all just common, uh, common uh, background. Okay, so we got an argument, and it's a very, very simple argument. Uh, that says that uh, given that background of the Zitterata, um, uh, there's got to be something wrong with the Darwinist uh, theory. Here's the argument. Uh, oh, maybe I should start out by saying this. Uh, we start with the assumption already uh, mentioned uh, that, um, that if a trait is selected, call it T1, T1 is uh, trait T1 is selected, then it's selected because, selected for a certain of its properties, namely it's a cause of fitness. Now there's all sorts of uh, um, uh, complications and elaborations and brokennesses that you can uh, put into this, and I don't care how it goes. For example, I don't care uh, what fitness is, uh, and, uh, and I'm quite content that we should say it's something like reproductive efficiency or, or that, or if you want to, uh, if you want to, want it to be mean number of hours survived or so, that's okay with me too, just as long as it's something we can compare uh, relative fitness. Uh, and just so long as there can be causal relations between having the phenotypic property T1 uh, and having some increment in fitness that would not have uh, been available to the creature, the creature would not have had uh, if it didn't have uh, T1. Uh, notice that, that uh, uh, I'm not denying, in fact, I'm asserting, I'm jumping up and down on the assertion that phenotypic traits actually do cause fitness. There's a matter of fact about whether uh, phenotypic trait TI is a uh, cause of a certain variation in fitness. And that's, you know, that fact is available to God. It's not an epistemological fact about us. It's not a, a construct or something, just a fact, right? Some traits cause fitness and some uh, don't. And uh, TNS is the view that it's being a cause of fitness that uh, responds, that is, uh, uh, that explains um, uh, trait fixation, phenotypic trait fixation. Another thing I don't care about is how that works. I just assume that it does. Okay, um, so that's all right, and I think it's untendentious so far, but now consider the following case. There are two phenotypic traits, and they're linked. What I mean is, so here's a linkage. Uh, what I mean is that any creature, any phenotype, uh, that contains T1 contains T2, and to make it uh, 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 maximally transparent, uh, assume that's biconditional. So you get T1 if and only if T2. That plays no central role in the, in the argument. It just makes it easier uh, for the exposition. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so here are these two traits, and they're uh, linked. Uh, and uh, one, namely T1 in this case, um, uh, is a cause of fitness, and T2, T2 is ne neutral in this respect. It's causally, let's say, linked to T1, uh, but, uh, but it's neutral as an effect in its effect on fitness. Okay, what's the Darwinian story? Well, the Darwinian story is there's gonna be a mechanism, and for reasons I'll mention, there's gonna be a mechanism, and for reasons I'll mention, uh, it's uh, a mechanism which, is, which Darwin thinks of as largely exogenous, and this is not, um, as it were, a dispensable attitude, uh, a defensible uh, addendum. To, sorry, this is not a dispensable addendum to the theory. It's something that's very central for reasons I'll come to later. There's a mechanism, and it's largely, at least, uh, ex, uh, 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 exogenous. Some si system of selectors that, in this situation, uh, reaches in or out, or however you want to look at it, and grabs T1 rather than T2. And so it's in virtue of the behavior of this mechanism that T1, uh, 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 which is a cause of fitness, uh, 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 is preferred to, uh, to T2 and ends up uh, in the phenotype, though T2 doesn't. Remember, the general thesis that we're trying to evaluate is that the defining property of... Uh, of uh, um, of uh, selection is that it, uh, it grabs properties in virtue of there being causes of fitness. That's what selection is for. Merely being linked to causes of fitness isn't good enough. If you, uh, uh, if you uh, 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 um, uh, broaden the theory to say, well, it's not just being a cause of fitness, it's being somehow connected to a cause of fitness, then the thing, the, the, the power of the theory to say what can be and what can't be in a, in a, a phenotype dissipates, right? It depends on what kinds of connections there are between phenotypic traits, and we have every reason to believe that there are all kinds. Uh, one is, the simplest one that I'm, the simple one uh, that I'm uh, talking about is, is the case where there's some sort of genetic commonality or something which guarantees that the traits come together, but there are millions of reasons. In fact, this is a sort of part of the evo, evo devo credo. There are millions of reasons why uh, uh, organic factors of one, or another, uh, one kind or another can uh, determine that uh, uh, there are correlations between uh, 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 phenotypic traits, and th these correlations can hold even if one but not the other is a, uh, 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 generates a uh, uh, increments of uh, fitness. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the picture, and um, uh, and what we want to argue is that there's no at, to, at a minimum there is no known kind of mechanism uh, uh, that there's no known kind of mechanism uh, that will perform this trait, and that there are at a more reasonable estimate. Uh, good reasons for thinking you couldn't have a mechanism that performs this, uh, uh, this function, okay? Uh, so um, here's the story. First thing to notice is that whatever this mechanism does in producing the causal relations which lead to the selection of this one over this one on the grounds of uh, the, a T1 but not T2 being a cause of fitness, however that thing works, what it's doing is not just causing T1 to become, it's not just a cause of T1 becoming phenotypic, it's an intentional cause of T1 becoming phenotypic. That is, what we've got, if Darwin's right, is a paradigm case of intentional causation. And that's, I, I think, uh, it's very easy to believe, in fact, I always did, that intentional causation is really very special stuff. In fact, you only get it in psychology. So, but it turns out uh, that it's playing a central role in Biology, too, if the, if the Darwinian story is, uh, a, is right, as, as I have sketched it. Uh, and the question is how there can be intentional causation of this kind. What does it mean to say that it's intentional causation? Well, just that it's causation that uh, can select between coextensive traits. So we're assuming that T1 and T2 are linked. So we're assuming that if an organism has T1, then it has T2, and vice versa. So, um, uh, so we're assuming that anything that chooses between them right, uh, um, uh, must be the kind of thing which does not require coextension, uh, which does not treat coextensive traits as, as equivalent. Okay? So 
This is just what coextension always means, right? It's not, and intentionality always means. That is, uh, suppose this is the trait of having long ears and this is the trait of having a red nose. They come together. Uh, you get one or uh, both. Uh, you get, sorry, uh, both or none. Uh, uh, and nevertheless, this mechanism Yeah, it's good. <laughs> okay. Um, so le let me stop at this uh, at uh, this juncture. Yeah. It would be really helpful to me if you could do that with my frogs from the previous talk. With what? My frogs. So I've got my frogs where T1 is being noise proof and yeah. T2 is being silent. Fine, yeah. No, there isn't any, hasn't been any criticism yet. I'm just setting out what I take it the theory is required to do. Um, it has often been said to me, and I must find, I must, uh, it was even said today, or said of me, uh, that I hold that in this situation, that there's something infirm about this picture, that in this situation, there can't be a matter of fact about uh, which is the cause of fit fitness, right? There's, uh, or it said, there's no, epistemic uh, accessibility uh, to the answer to the question, which is the cause of fitness. I do not hold either of these things. In fact, if I did hold either of these things, the argument that we're, I'm setting out would be useless, because I want to claim as against Darwin that, there, that his theory provides, his theory of how natural selection works, uh, 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 provides no mechanism for making this kind of distinction. Um, and that would be no objection unless this is a real distinction, right? It wouldn't be an objection to the Darwinian theory to say that it can't distinguish between coextensive properties if it turned out that there is no distinction between coextensive properties, right? This is only an objection if there really is a matter of fact uh, about, um, about which of these two things causes fitness. And moreover, uh, it's a matter of fact which is not by any, in any respect, uh, uh, epistemically uh, inaccessible. It's not just that there's such a fact, but we're, we can find it out, and we know perfectly well how we find it out. So, for example, um, uh, here's one way you do it. Uh, you um, you uh, construct, uh, suppose these are de facto coextensive, as I say. Um, well, one way to tell which one is the one that's responsible for fitness is just to use the method of dif differences. This is just, you know, Phil 101. Um, that is to say, you create a situation, an experimental situation, in which you get T1, but not T2. You, you bring about something in the experimental environment, which doesn't happen in the, in, by assumption, doesn't happen in the real world, or one in which you get T1, uh, T2 rather than T1, and then you see whether you get the increment of fitness in either or both of these situations. The one which continues to inc increment, increment uh, uh, 
fitness by a standard argument for method of differences uh, is the one uh, that, uh, that is presumably, unless there's some reason to think otherwise, that is causing the increase in fitness in the, in the uh, 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 non-experimental uh, uh, environment. This is, nothing more, this is nothing deeper than the remark that if you want to know whether it's the alcohol in the, in the drink or the ice cubes in the drink that's making you tipsy, you can run an experiment, and even on the assumption that in all the things you drink you get both or neither, you can run an experiment in which you get the alcohol but not the, uh, uh, the ice cube, and you can run an experiment uh, in which you get the ice cubes but not the alcohol, and barring interaction effects, uh, you will find out uh, that you get the tipsiness in one case but not in the other, so that's the one that's the cause of fitness. We, this is just the everyday standard, untendentious, uninteresting property, uh, process of, uh, of running a controlled experiment. There is, I will say it once more, because so many people think I'm lying when I say it, there is nothing in this argument which depends on saying that there's no fact of the matter about this, uh, about this being a cause of fitness and this not, or saying uh, that, uh, that there is a fact of the matter, uh, or, but it's for some reason epistemically accessible. Nothing could be more transparent than this is. It's the kind of situation we find uh, all the time. And what we do is, as I say, we appeal to counterfactuals. Fundamentally, I think what's going on here is we say, well, what would happen in a world in which you get T1 but not T2, what would happen in a world, what would have happened in this world if you got T1 but, uh, T2 but not T1, and uh, you find out which uh, outcome, uh, continue, which uh, uh, situation continues to give an outcome of uh, fitness, and that's the way you discover, that's the way you deconfound the, the variables, right? There's no, no ontological stuff up my sleeve. I don't think that there's no fact of the matter about which of confounded variables is the cause. <laughs> and there's no epistemological stuff up my sleeve either. Okay, so all right so far? Anybody deeply unhappy? Good. Um, so, uh, okay, um, um, we've got this, uh, uh, this uh, 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 method for deconfounding um, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 sorry, uh, decon uh, deconfounding linked variables, uh, and uh, and presumably it works in this circumstance, um, and presumably we can you know work it if we want to run an experiment to find out which one of these, which way as it were God draws this uh, uh, this, this diagram. Everything is above board and kosher so far. Um, Question, can you get a mechanism which will do that job? If you can't get a mechanism that will do that job, Darwin's in trouble. If what is really going on is uh, uh, in uh, uh, natural selection is breaking of a confounding, right? Distinguishing we, uh, the, which of two confounded variables is the one that has the causal powers, um, then there must be some mechanical way of doing it. I'm not, th that's independent of the fact that there must be some way for an observer to do it or a scientist to do it and so on. There must be some, some kind of mechanism that doesn't require ghosts and doesn't require God and doesn't require miracles and so on, such that you can construct it in the situation to choose this guy rather than this guy. If you can't do that, Darwin's in trouble. In fact, th the theory of natural selection is just the claim that there is such a mechanism. Okay, so for, uh, well, could there be such a mechanism? Uh, prima facie, in fact, uh, prima facie, anyway, um, um, listen. yeah, prima facie, um, um, there couldn't be. Let me put the relevant point in two kinds of ways. One way of putting it is, look, as far as anybody knows, if you want to break a coextension, Right. If you want a mechanism that will break a coextension, co it's got to be of, one two, uh, of two kinds. One is um, one that, that has access to laws that say, yeah, in a certain ecology or something, this one causes fitness and this one doesn't. Or there's got to be a mind in it. As far as I know, those are the only bona fide examples of intentional selection uh, in that you know, seem to be at least uh, compatible with uh, some kind of naturalist story. 
Um, so the reason mines are important is, suppose, remember that, uh, that Darwin took very seriously a putative analogy between artificial selection and natural selection. What goes on in artificial selection is that you get some guy, that there's a guy living in the mechanism, and he has certain intentions. He intends that uh, the uh, uh, next generation of phenotypes should have this property, but not this, pro this property. So he's got a goal in mind. And then he arranges things so that uh, if it has this property, it will cause fitness, and if it has that fact, uh, property, it won't. And the arrangement that he imposes on the situation reflects what he's got in mind. So if you've got a, a mind that, is, ha, that has intentions about how the causal relation should go, now we do not, nobody knows how that happens, of course, but it's a bona fide precedent for uh, 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 an intentional mechanism uh, playing a role in uh, causal explanation. The other possibility is uh, if you have laws of the kind which say, as it might be, in environment T, Uh, in ecology, uh, ecology, sorry, E. Um, um, uh, T1s cause fitness and T2s don't. That might be a law of nature. The point about laws is that, uh, that uh, laws are intentional entities too. Nomological explanation as opposed to punctate's uh, case by case causal explanation is a case of, uh, uh, of intentional explanation. Um, so if you had a law that connected the property of being T1 uh, with causing fitness, say, in a certain ecology, and there's no law that connects the property of being T2 uh, with uh, uh, being a cause of fitness in that ecology, then that would give you, then, then if this mechanism uh, has access to that law, as it were, knows about that law in the various ways it might, um, uh, then you could explain how these coextensive uh, traits behave differently under uh, the properties of select, under the processes of selection that this thing superintends. Okay, as far as I know, um, and th this is uh, uh, deeply puzzling, as far as I know, these are the only possibilities that have so far been invoked in serious scientific talk. It, you get obviously intentional psychology all over the, uh, 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 intentional causation with the insect, all over the place in psychology. You get uh, um, uh, causation uh, that involves appeal to covering laws of one sort or another all over the place, whether in psychology or not. And they're both, basic, they're both as far as anybody knows, perfectly good ways of supporting a claim to be able to make a distinction between coextensive properties. But that's all, again, as far as anybody knows. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, no, I mean intentional. So far, this, the, I mean intentional with an S in every case except this one, and this is both uh, S and T. Uh, it's intentional in the uh, sense of no substitution of co-referring expressions, and it's also intentional in the sense that, the, that it's beliefs and desires which have this property, okay? Um, uh, uh, there isn't any other story that I've heard about about how you could get a mechanism which chooses between coextensive uh, traits. Um, um, how could this mechanism do so? Well, it's got evidence. Uh, what, what's the evidence available to it for making this choice? Well, it gets evidence, it gets basically uh, uh, evidence, uh, correlational evidence, to, uh, which it tries to parlay, which it wants to parlay into evidence of causation. So. What's going on with this organism and what this, this mechanism has access to is that uh, uh, T1 correlates with uh, fitness and is thus prima facie uh, to be, uh, un, uh, to be uh, selected for. The trouble with, it, th with that is that so, that's true of this too, right? Because they're linked, any correlation between T1 and fitness entails a correlation between T2, uh, T2 and fitness uh, and, um, and, uh, and vice versa. So as far as the um, uh, operation of this machine is concerned, it can't distinguish uh, between, uh, between uh, um, this story, the one I've got on the board, and, uh, and that story. Why? Well, just because of the linkage. Because of the linkage. That's another way of saying the same thing that I was saying before. 
in order to work, this thing is going to have to be uh, intentional causation, intentional mechanism, uh, not the usual, uh, 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 not usual extensional notions like extensional notions like cause. Yeah. Well, it's hard to say because I think there isn't any mechanism that can do this. That's the worry. Um, but what a mechanism would be would be, be a machine. You put the machine out in the backyard. The machine sees what's going on. Um, um, it notices that there are correlations uh, between the presence of T1 in a creature and uh, the feet, uh, and the uh, um, uh, and the um, and the uh, increment of uh, fitness. And if it weren't that you also have that for T2, it would just say, okay, so presumably uh, the increase of uh, fitnesses. I'm, I'm sorry? No, 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 no. It's a, a what's that? There's got to be something in the world. There's got to be some causal system in the world, uh, according to Dar Look, this choice doesn't happen by miracle. There's got to be something in the environment or somewhere around. Yeah. The mechanism by which an biologist oh no! This is the right. Well, we're actually talking about both. It certainly isn't the the biologist's decision that we're talking about. It is indeed part of his theory. The theory says when you get this kind of confounding, you can still hold on to the view that to be uh, phenotypic is to be a cause of physics uh, of fitness because you can assume there's a mechanism which decides. Right, that this is that a mechanism in the world, some engine working in the world that decides between T1 and T2. Right, so look, I'm, I'm, you got something, here's something that the biologist is saying happens every day. There are these confounded traits, uh, one of them uh, is a cause of fitness, the other is not, so this one becomes phenotypic and the other doesn't. Okay, there's got to be some way that this works. Right? There's got to be some gadget or gizmo or whatever, such that in virtue of the operation of that gadget or gizmo, this thing becomes phenotypic and this thing doesn't. Right? That's part of the story about the world that Darwin is telling. Okay? Yes, sir. Um, maybe you put the mechanism in the wrong place. <laughs> Um, maybe because you're making it sound like you, look, you need a you need a dumb purely mechanical mechanism that's going to choose what property this thing. Yeah, is that's have. what I'm holding. That's but, exactly but, what I'm holding. But and, look, and well, you, you could you could have a mechanism, namely the rough and tumble of the backyard, that determines whether you get to keep that, that yes. characteristic that you have. Yes, I was going to. Or whether that. It, things like you get to stay around. Right. And you don't need intentionality for that. Uh, well, you need intentionality in a special sense. That is, that you need it to operate differently before, for coextensive traits, in the case of coextensive traits. You don't need mentality, but you need intentionality well, with an S. But why? Why? Um, it's, it's, it's the connection uh, between the trait and fitness. That what you're trying to do, wait, look, you try, what you're trying to do is choose uh, which one of these two is to become phenotypic, right? The story is, you choose the one which is fitness increasing. So if there's any causal system in the world that actually makes such a choice, it must distinguish T1 from T2 precisely in that T1 is a cause of fitness and T2 is not. I mean, that's what Darwin says is going on, right? Now, you're quite right. It could be uh, uh, creatures growling at one another in the backyard or something. That's perfectly true. Um, um, uh, and I, I want to, uh, at the very end, I'll come to that point. Yeah. That physical reality is the mechanism. Physi physical reality, if I say, look, uh, here's, I'm a theor uh, theorist. Look, I'm sorry? The aspect of physical reality which interacts Sure, with some the sort of interaction. Okay. Yeah, fine. Fine, yeah, that's good. But you gotta be able to say what those properties of the world are, uh, such that because they're operating, in this case, you get T1 as phenotypic and you don't get T2. Th this, I take it, is just banal, I mean, there's no, Yes, and I say you won't be able to do it because unless you can find an aspect of the, uh, of the uh, physical world which is sensitive to intentional, non-extensional distinctions. 
That's the problem. So these two have the same um, uh, uh, extensions by assumption, but only one of them is a cause of fitness. So whatever the mechanism in the world is that chooses this one and says, no, it's not this one that's to become phenotypic, it's got to be sensitive to some sort of difference between these coextensive properties. Okay? I'm sorry? Whatever. Uh, because the ones that have wings uh, will not proceed. As it might be. That would be fine. So there you have that sort of basic principle of physics, you know, uh, and basic, I'm, I'm sure, you yeah. can cleverly come up with an indefinitely large set of coins. Right. That's a perfectly good mechanism I'm using the no as I'm using the notion. Or, uh, so it could be any arrangement in the environment, including a computational arrangement in the environment, such that given a correlation between this and this, and a correlation between this and this, it says, uh, it chooses, it doesn't say, it chooses uh, this one is the cause of fitness and rejects that one. Okay, now there might be such a mechanism, but I, what I'm suggesting is, what I'm uh, going to suggest is that there's a further constraint that Darwin wants to impose, or maybe I've already mentioned this, which is that this mechanism, uh, that these selectors uh, be um, um, in large part or solely exogenous. And if you add that constraint, the theory's not gonna work. Okay, and you can see why. I mean, uh, because the fact that make these things, the linkage may well be endogenous, right? So they're linked in the genetics or something of that sort, but exogenous selectors can't look at that kind of linkage, so they can't figure out, as it were, uh, which of these two guys is the one that's, that's, uh, that's causing fitness. If you could look at the flow of causation, as it were, through the organism, you could see first that these uh, uh, were linked. That's why if uh, either of them is connected, correlated with fitness, both of them are. But you could also see that the path to the uh, I increment of fitness goes via T1 and not via T2, so everything would be fine. As long as some of the selectors are endogenous. If they're exogenous, or largely exogenous, then you can't use that because exogenously, from the outside of the organism, these two situations look exactly identical. There's a correlation between fitness and T1, and there's also a correlation between fitness and T2, and the magnitude of the correlations is, uh, is identical. Okay, that's basically the argument. Um, uh, yes? It's a law of nature uh, on thermodynamic considerations yeah. that when it processes information, there will also be heat. And that's yes. that would be fine. Um, endogenous. And I have a signal coming in, and I get <clears throat> a, an amplified version of the signal coming out. Right. Can't I, on physical grounds, think that the heat increase was not the, the pathway? Yes, absolutely. Well, that, then that's, why can't Darwin do that? That's exactly the right thing. That's one of the exactly right things to say. And the answer is, remember, this story is supposed to be a piece of biology, not a piece of physics. So this story ought to be looking for uh, uh, exogenous factors at the biological level. Right, which are such that if they're in operation, you get a choice between these two. Otherwise, the whole theory is vitiated. I mean, the, the whole theory doesn't amount to a constraint. Why? Because there's going to be a physical connection for anything, any causal relation at whatever level. Right. So, of course, there's going to be some physical story about why this thing is the cause of fitness and this thing isn't. But that's not the, a story that you want to tell in your biology. Not unless you're permission. Uh, not unless you're inclined to say, well, biology just is, well, let, as let, they used to say, physics example. plus labels. S suppose, suppose that that um, we're in a situation where um, a change in in color of a bird's feather mm -hmm. reduces its vulnerability to predation. And suppose becoming darker mm -hmm. happens to go with. Uh, suppose the mechanism uh, happens to involve, uh, incidentally, the eggshell changing color. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, T1 is having uh, black feathers and T2 is having an orange eggshell. Yeah, right, um, and they're linked. And as I understand it, you're, right. you're, you're claiming that it, I wouldn't be doing biology if I said that the selection went via the change in it, it, the, the, the change in feather color rather than the change of egg color because that's physical? 
No, 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 you wouldn't be doing biology because you'd be saying that the connection is determined by whether it's a cha that what's being selected is uh, egg color from beak color or something of that sort. If you're saying, oh, well, I'm interested in positron flow here as opposed to positron flow there, well, of course you're going to get an explanation. You've got to get an explanation because uh, uh, every event is a physical event. The question in, the question in uh, special so the science... Predators don't look at the eggs, I'm imagining. I'm sorry? So the way in which selection takes place won't, because the pre we're imagining predation on, on adult birds, yeah. uh, uh, the predation won't occur on the egg, so the change in egg color that's, that's imagined is correlated in development with the change in bird color, right. uh, that, um, uh, that plays no role in the way in which selection takes place. So well, how does the correlation a, work? Hmm? I mean, how does it turn out that this thing gets selected? I'm not understanding the example. Um, the predator selects, uh, uh, the predator goes after these things and doesn't go out after these things, so this thing causes fitness and these things don't. Okay, fine. That looks like, a, a, that looks like a, a, a counterfactual supporting biological explanation. If you had those kinds of things, if it were the case that there were mechanisms that one could uh, pick out, essentially counterfactual, counterfactual supporting generalizations of just the ones you have in mind, um, um, then fine, there would, be, uh, there would be a mechanism in this sense for choosing between these two and there's no problem. All I'm saying is it can't satisfy the request for the demand for a mechanism that there be some me mechanism specifiable in the vocabulary of physics, right? This got to be a biological, it's got to be a biological story. Now, I, I mean, this is quite true in any, in any of the special sciences. It's important for there being in special science theories that, uh, that um, uh, the demand for mechanism be not satisfied at the physical level, right? Because if it's satisfied at the physical level, then the explanation of why you get these two is a physical explanation and, uh, and the biology drops out. Yeah. Get back to the frogs because it's a real example, and following many years of having it beaten into me by David Hull, I think only real examples are worth discussing. I mean, you know, we've got a T1, we've got a T2, right. we've got a selection scenario that mentions T1, which is, you know, leg waving is detectable in noisy environments, Fine. and that's why it's great. Yeah. And it's also silent, and that's irrelevant, although you could imagine it was relevant, but Fine. it isn't. Um, you know, I, I'm just trying to get why it is that, so my biological generalization, which I'm appealing to, is on three continents in a couple of dozen cases, you stop using an auditory signal when you live in a noisy environment. And yeah. according to you, that's physics? That's not Well, physics. yeah, but that's, that's not, in, in that case, that's not the objection. The objection is it's not general. See, look, there There's are two three things. continents and like two dozen species independently evolving this thing. That's look, there general. are two. Th no, no, no. <laughs> look, the, there are two uh, kinds of uh, of problems that can can arise in an attempt to to meet this condition. One is that it it's met only at the physical level, and it's obvious why you're not interested in that. Uh, another is, however, that uh, is uh, is that it's met in different ways for each case of adaptation. Right. So if it's an adaptation of color or of color at a certain kind of bird, then there's one mechanism. If it's an adaptation of, I don't know, body size or something, then there's another. And what you don't get is what a theory of evolution is supposed to give you, namely what the common feature of all these cases is. Right. A theory of evolution is, to say, is supposed to say not only that this happens, but that in some, in some uh, reasonable sense, it's what happens when you get fixation of traits. Otherwise, it's not a theory of evolution. It's a theory, it's what it, what it is, a sort of historical geographical survey of how particular traits got fixed in particular phenotypes. Now, you can give those kinds of stories, right? And in fact, I think that's what much of the interest of evolutionary uh, 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 observations is. The question is whether or not you can put them all together, get something that satisfies this uh, set of desiderata, uh, and that is the same, has the same story about selectors in the various kinds of cases. And I suspect the only way you can do that is, at, is in physics, if you can do it at all, right? So remember, you got a number of desiderata, including the one that this is not just a theory, not just a historical story about how this creature ended up having this trait. It's supposed to be a theory of how traits are fixated. Right. The fact that you can tell a story in one case is of not no particular interest unless you can tell the same story in another case. I take this to be another banal remark. I don't think there's anything 
and then just about it. Yeah. Jerry, I think, I think things, I mean, I know you won't accept, I think I know why you won't accept this, but just let me try and take this one stage further. The way I always look at this is in the following way. Um, if you classify traits using ecological categories, and yes. you just pointed out that those will be unique, so right. it will be, you know, um, right. detectable in high ambient noise versus if it's a camouflaged egg, it's going to be, you know, right. easily seen on, you know, right. against a background of guano droppings right. or something, right? Um, uh, you, you can classify traits ecologically, and that'll plug you into locally valid ecological generalizations. Right. If you classify those traits, the only more abstract classification is classifying them simply as related via relative fitness functions to their competitors. Yes. So you're straight up into the math. Then the theory is vacuous. What's, so but in that case, it's not physics. I mean, the objection ought to be an no. objection that Elliot Sober often, you know, considers, right. which is the objection that the only, when you state selection theory at the level of generality you're demanding, it turns out to be a priori true. Exactly. In which case, I would give you Elliot's challenge, which is what is wrong with a priori truth? Nothing's wrong cool with a priori, priori truth, truth, but it's, uh, it's a bad idea, uh, as, in fact, Mill found out, is a bad idea uh, to be an a priori truth masquerading as an empirical theory, right? And in fact, what you're suggesting, and this was the point I was gonna end on, what you're suggesting was, is exactly what, um, what a number of commentators on uh, the book uh, suggested. Hold on. So uh, what they say is, look, um, um, hello? Yeah, what they say is, look, the problem, there isn't any problem of the kind that Massimo and I were raising. Why isn't there any problem of that kind? Well, because I'm looking for something that connects being chosen, being phenoty uh, becoming phenotypic with being a cause, of, with being uh, selected, and that the, the features that cause fitness are selected, that generalization isn't supported by a mechanism, it's an analytic truth. Uh, this seems to me grotesque uh, for a number of different reasons, but. I do want to convince you in the first place that that is what people say. So here's a um, quotation from a, a blog uh, uh, posit uh, 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 authored by uh, Block and Kitcher. Uh, they say, um, since selection for is identical to having a differential effect on reproductive success, they're identical, they're not connected by a mechanism, they're just the very same thing. Uh, um, one might suppose that, it, say in the moth case, um, uh, uh, Fodor and friend would uh, have to accept the dark, the, that the dark color was selected for, whereas properties uh, that are merely correlated with the dark color were not. I take it everybody knows this moth story. Yeah, okay. Um, but, continuing, they say, we hedge this acceptance of the standard identification, for we go on to say, Darwin needs an account of selection for that distinguishes phenotypic traits that are, are cause fitness from phenotypic traits that are merely correlated with fitness, with causes of fitness. We, that is, Block and Kitcher, find their odd, odd demand frustrating for as the pertinent terms are used in evolutionary theory and biology, traits that cause fitness just are traits that are selected for. So it's a semantic fact that, uh, that if you're a cause of fitness, you're selected for, if you're not a cause of fitness, you're not selected for, and you don't need, in effect, a mechanism which tells you how the selection runs. Uh, here's some more of the same. Fodor and Piotelli think that in order uh, for dark color rather than some correlated trait to be selected for, there is need for a device that responds selectively to one rather than the other, um, uh, and this is simply an ex eccentric invention. It is as if having abandoned Mother Nature we think uh, that there has to be a mechanism to take the place of Mother Nature. Uh, but the job is done by causation itself. That phrase was used sometime yesterday. The job is done by causation it, uh, itself. Dark color promotes progeny. No other mechanism is needed. Now, I do think that's crazy. Consider the, uh, the uh, following an anal uh, um, um, uh, 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 analogy. Uh, uh, here's a regularity. Incoming calls cause the ringer on my phone to ring. How does that work? Well, no problem comes the answer. If incoming calls didn't cause the ringer to ring, it wouldn't be a ringer. Being a ringer and being caused to ring by incoming calls are interdefined. That being so, um, 
uh, there doesn't need to be a mechanism that causes a ringer to ring in response to incoming calls. The job is, to quote, done by causation itself. No other mechanism is needed. Now, I take it that's crazy. It's true that if you're a ringer, uh, then, uh, then you ring for incoming calls. That's what a ringer is. It doesn't begin to follow that you don't need a theory of ring uh, ringers. You don't need a theory which says, how is it that something which is sensitive to an incoming fall, a call is also a cause of uh, ringing? That's what a ringer is. What you need, another way to put it is, you've got uh, on this story, as analytic, uh, 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 some generalization of the form Fs or Gs, and the suggestion is you don't need an explanation of why X or, uh, X or, Fs or Gs, uh, so long as there's an analytic collection between the two. This is really, you know, going back to the 50s, it's the, uh, the uh, philosophy of, of uh, uh, biology tracking uh, the philosophy of mind. So there was this guy, um, uh, Gilbert Ryle, of whom uh, many of you will have heard. Uh, here's what uh, uh, Gilbert Ryle stumbled across a copy of Descartes one day uh, and, uh, and found Descartes saying, uh, look, when you want your arm uh, to raise, then caterus paribus, your arm goes up, right? Now, how could there be a causal link between the two? That, I think, is a very good question, but it's not one that Ryle undertook to answer. Why? Because he said, well, look, you don't need to answer that question. You don't need a, me a mechanism. It's a logical truth, a conceptual truth, a semantic truth, or something of that sort, that when you want your arm to go up, then all else equal, your arm goes up. That won't fly, right? You can't replace uh, a, uh, uh, a mechanistic explanation with a claim of analyticity. And the basic reason you can't is that if the General, the, if the underlying generalization is Fs or Gs, if that's the, under, the generalization uh, uh, that, that you're trying to explain, um, arm raisings are caused by wants to uh, raise your arm and so forth and so on, um, it's perfectly true that you can't ask the question, you can't give a mechanistic ex uh, uh, explanation uh, of why Fs or Gs, that would be like giving an, a mechanistic explanation of why bachelors are married, and that's exactly, unmarried, and that's exactly the case Ryle has in mind, right? So he says that, you can't get that kind of, uh, of explanation, so it's foolish to ask for it in this case. But of course that's, that uh, argument is no good. Uh, the argument is no good because what you can ask for is why aren't there things that are just like Fs except for not being Gs? Right? And that requires a mechanical explanation. So here's the back story. About a year ago, Massimo Piatelli and I, um, I should say the reason for the combination, Massimo knows something about biology and I don't. Um, so uh, Massimo and Piatelli and I uh, uh, teamed up uh, to give an argument for, uh, for a claim that we both thought was probably right, though for some different reasons, somewhat different reasons. Uh, the claim is that, uh, that the uh, theory of natural selection here, in, here and after TNS uh, is inherently flawed and, thought, and that on uh, very weak empirical assumptions, in fact, empirical assumptions that are known to be true, uh, it can't be fixed. Uh, um, I should say at the start that this is not, this is an attack on TNS, which is a rather limited, uh, highly articulate, uh, uh, compact uh, theory. It's not an attack on evolution. 
evolution has all sorts of uh, significant uh, uh, claims, like, for example, that speciation represents a tree or something of that kind, is represented by a tree. Uh, all sorts of claims that have nothing to do with TNS, except at one crucial point, that is that TNS it purports in the... Okay, so um, we have this argument, uh, Massimo and I do, uh, which is that, as I think I said, on, on very, very weak empirical assumptions, uh, that, in fact, assumptions that are patently true, um, there can't be a mechanism that performs the processes that acts, that uh, runs through the processes that uh, Darwin thinks that the theory, that, or that the theory of natural uh, se selection thinks that uh, evolution uh, depends on. So there's got to be something wrong with the theory. Okay, that's going to be the form of the argument. Uh, as you can see, at least as far as I can, at least as far as I can see, there's nothing tendentious in anything that I've just said. Everybody thinks that Darwin is committed to some sort of uh, selectionist account of tray fixation. Everybody thinks that he's committed to mechanism, uh, and so on. So this is all, so this is all just common, uh, common uh, background. Okay, so we got an argument, and it's a very, very simple argument. Uh, that says that uh, given that background of desiderata, um, uh, there's got to be something wrong with the Darwinist uh, theory. Here's the argument. Uh, oh, maybe I should start out by saying this. Uh, we start with the assumption already uh, mentioned uh, that, um, that if a trait is selected, call it T1, T1 is uh, trait T1 is selected, then it's selected because, selected for a certain of its properties, namely it's a cause of fitness. Darwinian and neo-Darwinian uh, uh, traditions uh, to give the mechanism uh, by which evolution works. Okay, so evolution uh, uh, does various kinds of things, including what will be important for us, the fixation of phenotypic traits. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and one might well ask, well, how does it go about doing that? Uh, answer, uh, well, uh, uh, it's, it, it goes about doing that because the mechanism of, uh, of the theory of natural selection, the mechanism imported uh, in the theory of natural selection is up and uh, running. So it's perfectly possible to have one's doubts about the theory of natural selection. It's even possible to have the theory, the, the, uh, the, suspi uh, the suspicion that the theory simply doesn't work. Um, uh, and not have any problem with evolution or, or with uh, uh, we all used to be paramecia or something of that kind. I'm taking that whole story as, as uh, uh, common ground among uh, civilized people. Uh, and, uh, and I'm not going to argue about that. I, I have no interest in creationism. I have no interest in God. I have no interest in any of that stuff. I'm interested in a f straightforwardly, I take it, uh, scientific question. Namely, does the uh, theory of natural selection account for the facts about uh, phenotypic trait uh, fixation? Okay. I'm going to, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, make a couple of assumptions which, which I think uh, aren't... Uh, tendentious before we get to the part that's violently tendentious. Um, the, the two assumptions I care about, and, and again, here, raise your hand if you think there's something wrong with them. Uh, the first is that the question TNS wants to answer is, just the, is the one that I just mentioned. Why do uh, creatures have the phenotypic traits that they do? That's the sort of ur question. You find a phenotypic trait, um, um, you find one of these funny animals that biologists talk about, and, and you say, gee, this is a funny animal. How come it has 400 eyes? Uh, and the answer is, well, some story that fits the general pattern of TNS uh, will show you that, uh, that uh, having uh, 400 eyes rather than 412 or, or two or something of that sort uh, is a good thing in the ecology uh, in which this uh, uh, animal lives out its uh, life. Uh, so the question is, how come is it that creatures have the phenotypic properties that they do, traits that they do? And the answer is roughly phenotypic traits are, the, are selected for, uh, at, sorry, let me reparse that. Phenotypic traits are selected for being causes of fitness, okay? So if you find me a phenotypic tri a trait on a certain kind of organism in a certain kind of ecology, uh, and you ask me how come it's that, we got that trait in this kind of organism, in this ecology, rather than some other uh, uh, trait. The answer is going to be that, uh, that 
um, the former but not the latter, or the former but not as much as the latter, is a uh, cause of, uh, of uh, uh, fitness in that kind of organism, in this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, ecology. Um, I take it that's untendentious, unless somebody thinks I've just misunderstood uh, the Darwinian tradition, which is perfectly possible. Uh, but I take it that's essentially untendentious, and, uh, and, um, um, and I take it also to be untendentious uh, that uh, if there is such a process, there must be a mechanism that performs it. So it's a test on the theory of natural selection, or really any other scientific theory, that, uh, that uh, there must be some way, at least in principle and preferably in practice, of constructing a, a mechanism, a piece of matter, uh, such that uh, uh, given the way that mechanism is constructed and the environment in which it operates, it will in fact produce the distributions that the uh, theory uh, talks about. So non-mechanical uh, uh, examples, non-mechanical uh, answers to the to the basic question, how come organisms have the phenotypic traits they do? Non-mechanical answers are not allowed. Uh, so one thing that's not allowed is you're not allowed to say it's a miracle. And another, another thing that's not allowed is you're not allowed to say it's a creature of, uh, it's a, a consequence of, uh, uh, of divine intentions. But another one is you're not allowed to say, well, it's got to be done, done somehow, but I have no story. Uh, in fact, I can't even conceive of a story about how it's done. So we want these to be mechanical theories in some uh, appropriate sense of, uh, uh, of mechanical. No ghosts, no miracles, none of that stuff. <clears throat>